Welcome to another edition of Papers We Love at Fastly. Uh, the last of the year. Woo! Woo! Yay! Okay. Uh, can you raise your hand if this is your first Papers We Love? Cool. Nice. Excellent. Awesome. You brave the rain and the cold and the holidays. Thank you so much. We're freaking out about who was going to show up or not. I'm going to take a photo. It's perfect. Okay. Um, it's, I don't, it's kind of crazy because we just started this meetup this year. March, Inez had the idea to do it. I helped the logistical part of it, and here we are. Um, we have over 400 members in the San Francisco group, which is amazing, a really active chapter. Like, all our videos are up. I know papers we love, like the group itself consistently pulls our videos into their channel, and it's great to, to see a bunch of people come again and again, and for new people to come, and, Sorry, I'm just, just taking, I'm just taking uh -huh. stock in the year. I mean, I, yeah. it's just me. Um, but anyway, thank you so much for coming. Fastly is a CDN that's super fast and developer friendly, in case you don't know. We are also hiring for most positions if you're interested. I know Tyler was talking to a couple of you, um, and we have a few developers in the back if you want to ask questions or chat. Um, we're very community and open source oriented, so if you have a meetup group or uh, an open source program or project that you need help with or you want to make faster or anything like that, let us know and we'll definitely help out. Um, and we also came up with a new concept for 2015 for Papers We Love um, called Papers We Love Mini. Uh, and this comes because Inez has a habit of uh, planning like 10 months ahead for meetups, literally. Um, so we want to give more people a chance to talk about papers they love and, you know, practice their presentation chops and things like that. So what we're going to... Are you, do you... Is it okay that I'm... All right, whatever. Okay. So um, what we're going to start doing is every month alongside the... Uh, main presentation, we're going to do two five to seven minute talks um, from other people about papers they really like, an abridged kind of papers we love presentation. So if you're interested in doing that, definitely come talk to us. I will be doing one of the first ones in January, yeah. uh, which is terrifying because I've never spoken at a meetup. Uh, and sorry, <laughs> chatting. Yeah. All right, so uh, this is normally the part where we do the administ trivia part. Uh, 2014, as Elaine mentioned, was our first year. We ended up doing 10 meetups, and I would like to thank anybody, everybody that spoke. So we have Leif, Cal, Armand, Peter, Henry, Joel, Bruce, Bruce uh, Andy, Ryan, Angeli, and Peter, and I would like to give them an applause because this is recorded, and they've done a great job. So thank you to all of our speakers. As Elaine mentioned, uh, since I booked us almost a year in advance, uh, some of you came to me with ideas for next year, and, and your willingness to give a presentation is awesome, and I want to encourage that. So I will start asking you if I know you and you're a regular, or if you're new, if you want to do a five to seven minute presentation. Uh, we'll list it in the website. Uh, you work with me uh, to get it set up and everything, and um, I'll expect me to bug you. So it's just a regular thing. So I have a few of, of you already tagged for next year, so thank you in advance. And if, you're, if you, like, you want to present or if you have something that you're excited about, it doesn't necessarily have to be a paper per se, but it could be an idea. And the only requirement that we have is something that, that could be expressed in five to seven minutes. So, so that's the only thing. For next year, we're going to have on January 22nd, Alex Rasmussen talk about flood data center storage design. Alex, can you raise your hand? Okay, so Alex is the person that stole Sargent's topic for next year. So now you should meet each other because, uh, yes, it, it was interesting. So, and then in February, we have Katie McCaffrey talking about Orleans. So that's kind of it. Uh, if you want to email me your ideas, I would be like, it would be great. There is more wine. Since this is the end of the year, just, just go crazy. And uh, without further ado, let's give it to Peter. And thank him, thank you again for, for doing this and closing the year. So woo. All 
All right, super. Um, awesome. So I'm here today to talk about Bayou, uh, which is a really cool distributed system from, from the past that I think we can learn from when we're building systems today. Um, first of all, before we start, I want to say thank you to Fastly. Uh, I think this is like an awesome event. So I love reading papers and talking about them and discussing them. You know, there's a lot of good papers out there. There's a lot of bad papers out there. There's some in the middle. And you know, discussing them with, with other people who are excited about reading them is just is, is fantastic. So to see an event like this uh, you know, in San Francisco, in the Bay Area, is just phenomenal. So thank you, Inez, and thank you to Fastly for, for putting this on. Uh, and thank you all for, for coming as well, right? So it's terrible weather out here. Um, I'm, I'm touched that you're all here. And for those of you who are online or in the future, uh, <laughs> watching this on YouTube, thanks, thanks as well. Um, all right, so who am I? Uh, I'm a PhD student at Berkeley. I care about distributed databases. I'm really excited about distributed databases. I think they're like one of the coolest topics in the world. And you know, the issues that we face today, building, say, geo-distributed services, are really unique and pose just awesome questions that, that we have to solve that both impact production systems and also have some some principle behind them that we have to answer, like when do we have to coordinate, and what happens if we don't coordinate. Um, I'm fortunately graduating next year, and uh, I'm on the academic job market. Maybe after that, I'll go on the industrial job market if things don't <laughs> turn out so well. Uh, but yeah, the, you can find more details online. So today, we're here to talk about Bayou, right? So managing update conflicts in Bayou, a weakly connected, replicated storage system. This is one of my favorite papers in sort of the distributed systems canon. That teaches us a lot about some fundamental you know, lessons about how we should build these distributed systems in a, in a sort of weakly connected, highly available manner. So just so I get a, like, a little bit of feedback, um, who read the paper beforehand? Okay, so maybe like a quarter of you. Um, so I expect to be grilled. Uh, so please uh, call me out on anything you'd, you'd like to you know, hear about or, or any mistakes that I make. Um, and for the rest of you, I'll try to provide some, some context as well, right? So I'm assuming that none of you have read this, but for those of you who had, you're, you're, you're ahead of the gang. So why did I choose Bayou today? I think of Bayou as sort of NoSQL before NoSQL. Um, so a lot of the challenges that, that this paper was trying to solve effectively come up today, albeit in a little bit different context. And I think especially you know, as a researcher, but also as sort of systems builders, we can learn from our predecessors, learn from their successes, and learn from their mistakes in building sort of high-performance data infrastructure. Um, I like Bayou a lot because essentially, and you know, I'll spend most of the talk on this, Bayou essentially makes us rethink the system boundary and what it means for an application to try to perform updates in a system, right? It actually sort of brings the application logic into the uh, system execution. And from a, hmm, so, okay, back online, super. Um, though my notes are off, let's see. Sorry about that. All right, and from like a, just a pure paper point of view, you know, I think it actually does a good job discussing system challenges. So if you were to just like read a paper off the shelf, it's pretty self-contained and there's some interesting discussion there. Like the authors actually consider the alternatives of their design and I, and I like that, right? It's, it's very boring to read a paper that says this is what we built and doesn't tell you why they built that or what mistakes they made along the way. So this is why, this is maybe one of the big reasons why I think this is, this is a good paper. So in terms of the outline, this is kind of boring, but just to let you know where we're going, go over some background, go over the basic system architecture. And I want to spend most of the talk on sort of conflict detection and resolution, what that means in a system like Bayou. We'll spend a lot of time talking about what correctness means and what the concept of order has to do with you know, building high-performance database systems. And then, you know, since we're all, well, many of us are probably building these types of systems and all of us are interacting with them, you know, what kind of lessons we can take away from, from this paper in particular. So to get started, my clicker's kind of coming in and out. Let's just do this. Great, so what's Bayou about? Bayou was written in, uh, well, the Bayou project started in the early 90s, like 1994. Uh, this paper was written in 1995, and around that time, does anyone know what this thing is on the, on the left? An Apple, did anyone own an Apple Newton? Or other sort of hip, early PDA? Yeah, yeah, we got the guys in the back. The Scion, is that right? So pretty, pretty serious tech. Um, 
you know, these devices were coming out finally. You know, I looked on Wikipedia. They go back to like 19, early 1980s. First PDA was like 84. But these, these technologies of like mobile PDAs, which as we all know kind of turned into, turned into these, right, our smartphones, um, were coming out. And, they, and, the, and these researchers wanted to ask, you know, how do we build a storage system that facilitates the needs of these mobile devices? So specifically when we're, when we're sort of like, the, you know, the benefit of these mobile devices, like, like the Apple Newton, is you can, you know, be in the library, as the paper talks about. You know, you're kind of updating your bibliography because you're like a very studious, you know, uh, student of the, of the distributed systems literature. And you, you suddenly you can't get on the Internet, right? And you want to be able to handle this case where we aren't able to connect in a, in a graceful manner, okay? Now, what's cool about reading papers from, from the past, right? We're almost like 20 years past this paper, is that... Many of the challenges in distributed systems, particularly in these distributed systems uh, papers like Bayou, keep recurring throughout history, right? So this idea of handling frequent disconnections is not actually new. For instance, you know, there's an RFC. How many of you have seen this RFC? It's from 1975. It's called the Maintenance of, of Duplicate Databases. And this is like one of the first mentions of essentially the CAP theorem in uh, in, in sort of the, the literature, right? This is an RFC saying, hey, you know what? If we put multiple databases on a network and suddenly they can't talk, we might run into some hard issues, okay? So this is 75. Fast forward to 95, we've got Bayou. And then fast forward to today, 2014, almost 15, right? We made it through uh, 2014, almost. Uh, and we, we run systems that, that run on things like AWS, where we're across multiple data centers, and the cost of communication is expensive, and sometimes we can't even you know, make those, um, you know, sometimes the links aren't even available. So I think that this goal is actually you know, couched in the context of mobile replication in the paper, but, but it, it applies, you know, it's sort of a timeless goal, right? Number one, does anyone know the number one uh, fallacy of distributed computing? Peter Deutsch's distributed computing? What is it? Exactly, like the, the network is not reliable, okay? And that's kind of uh, this theme that runs through the paper. And so what's cool about this paper is the authors make a very serious deal about reasoning about this distribution, the fact that we have latency, and the fact that we have partial failure explicitly. So has anyone read this other paper, A Note on Distributed Computing? Has anyone seen this? So a small handful of people. I'll put these slides online so, so you can get the references later. But um, essentially in the 90s, a lot of people, like very smart people, were very excited about this idea of, of taking sort of your address space sitting on your single box and distributing it. And you call this distributed shared memory. It's like a beautiful idea, right? We can just take clusters of computers and we can interact with just pointers. And you know, who cares if it's on the other machine? Okay. Sounds good, right? I mean, who, who, who wants to use vir distributed virtual memory to, uh, today? I mean, unfortunately, there's a lot of problems here. And this node on distributed computing makes this very good case that in a distributed system, masking distribution is essentially an anti-pattern, right? There's a lot of bad things that can occur in terms of reliability, programmability, and so on, when suddenly I access one pointer, I get it in, you know, literally microseconds, I fetch it from DRAM, and I access the other pointer, and I go across the network, and this is like in 1990, so these networks are super, super slow, and I stall for milliseconds, right? It's just not a great, uh, you know, sort of way of thinking about the world. We want to make distribution explicit, and that's one of the goals of Bayou. So Bayou sort of embodies as a system this type of um, need to, to reason about distribution. And as I'll spend most of the time on, essentially there's this problem when we have multiple sort of actors in the system, how do we reason about their concurrent updates, right? And Bayou does a very nice job of, of, of sort of facilitating, detecting when conflicts occur, and then sort of resolving them accordingly. So if I were to kind of sum up Bayou's goal uh, you know, in one sentence, it would be, you know, how do we build a system that allows update anywhere, so any server can respond to any request, but still allows users to easily build correct applications? That's a pretty tall order. There are many databases today that are still trying to solve this problem. And I think the techniques we'll talk about today can actually be used in, in those systems as well. Imagine there's a system on the screen and in the system, there are a bunch of servers, and these servers are loosely, loosely connected. Uh, essentially, the Bayou architecture is, is what we call you know, update anywhere, right? So this is essentially the essence of sort of CAP. Oh, there we go. And the slide, yeah. Uh, so this is basically CAP. Eight. So who's heard of the CAP theorem? Just, just show of hands. Okay, so this is, this is basically saying, if I want to be able to update everywhere, there are trade-offs in terms of the semantic guarantees I can provide about the data in my database. So 
this is going to guarantee us availability, right? If my client can get to a server in my system, it'll be able to get a response, it'll be able to perform writes. And this guarantees availability. It also guarantees sort of very low latency operation. Uh, so I don't have to you know, go over the you know, wide area network, or even local area network to service requests. And this really gives me a nice scalability property. I can like, add more nodes. Those, no those new nodes don't have, to, don't have to communicate with the other nodes. And so uh, I get really excellent um, sort of throughput. Uh, let's see. So this is referred to in the literature, uh, this is a really great survey as sort of optimistic replication, right? So you, you, you do all your stuff locally, you cross your fingers, and you send it over the network, right? Where other people receive it and they say, they pick up your write or they pick up your operations, and they say, all right, well, I, should, I need to do something with it. So the question in Bayou is, what do we do? So it's update anywhere, gives us very good availability, low latency, um, and it uses this thing called anti-entropy to exchange updates. So anti-entropy is actually like a very cute name. So en you know, entropy being sort of randomness or, the, or sort of the, the amount of information in the system, and or disorder, if you will. So anti-entropy, so this is a, it's a concept in physics. Anti-entropy is basically bringing order back to the system. So anti-entropy is a way of basically shipping and exchanging sort of uh, operations in a database, and there's a bunch of ways to do this. Uh, the Bayou Project actually explored efficient algorithms for anti-entropy. Um, I'm not going to go into them today, but the basic idea is we're just going to be broadcasting and flooding our writes through this system. Okay, so this shouldn't look so different. This, this system architecture shouldn't look so different from uh, system architectures you're familiar with today. Like basically, every database looks sort of like this. The key factors are that we're going to update on any device, and we're just going to send these writes around kind of asynchronously. Um, so we could deploy this very easily on a system like AWS today. So that's the, sort of the basic system architecture. Any questions so far? It's not, that part's like not super interesting. It's basically any database you've used, any eventually consistent database you've seen. What's cool is, what ask, is when you ask, well, what, what, what happens when we actually do these updates, right? And the main problem in Bayou is handling conflicts, uh, or in this paper, certainly. And the answer is, you know, the question is, what happens if two clients simultaneously update the same data item? So just, just a quick example here. Um, if I want to book Fastly headquarters, tonight at 7 p.m., and then Nez also wants to book Fastly HQ at the same time. We're connected to different servers. We guarantee availability. What's going to happen? Right. We, can certainly, we can certainly allow Nez and I to each make you know, our updates to the, to the schedule, but somehow we'd like these replicas to agree. Right? So, so what's going to happen in this scenario? We need, to, we need to say something. The system needs to have some sort of behavior to reconcile this. So this is, in a sense, a conflict, right? This is what we would colloquially refer to a con like conflicting operations. Another example, um, say Mike wants to give Peter $100, and Carol wants to give Peter $100, and they're connected to different servers. So what will happen in this case, right? Is this safe to execute concurrently? Like, is this somehow safer than the above example? Like, is this a conflict? I mean, the answer to this question is that it's going to depend on the application, right? There are some semantics about the application that we, that we need to know in order to determine whether or not sort of the operations we're performing in this update anywhere manner are actually safe or not. And so, you know, if you put on your traditional databases hat, right, and you, like, went back to undergrad DB, you know, like, God forbid anyone have to remember that. Um, no, I actually like databases. Um, hire me. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> But if I, you know, you dig up your database textbook, right, and you, you say, okay, well, you know, you're going to say any two updates to the same data item will always matter, right? Traditional sort of acid semantics will, it will enforce that concurrent updates need to sort of be arbitrated, and you'd have to coordinate here. But again, like, this is a bit unsatisfactory. Like, it's sufficient to always coordinate and always just see arbitrate between these updates, but it's not always necessary, right? And it really does depend on the application. So Bayou's answer here, which is why I like the paper so much, is it essentially says, let's let the application help us out as a system. Let's let the application define what a conflict means. So Bayou's interface, and we can, we'll, we'll revisit this interface, because I, I think it's a little bit counterintuitive, but, but as presented in the paper, Bayou writes essentially are broken up into three bits. So the first bit is an update function. It's just the, the write itself. The second bit is what's called the dependency check. And this basically detects, according to some application logic, was there a conflict? And the third bit 
is what's no, what they call a merge function, which says, if a conflict is detected, issue some compensation logic, right? So I'll, I'll go through a few examples shortly, but the basic idea here is you run this function on the server that says, you know, if the dependency check passes, then you can just do the update. That means whatever sort of logic that the database update depended on is still good, right? Everything in the local database is consistent with respect to the update, so we'll just apply the update blindly. That's fine. And then if that fails, then, then, we'll, then we'll have to compensate. So it, it's just sort of simple, um, sort of simple framework for thinking about, about, about conflicting updates. So let's go through an example just to make this really concrete. So if we want to book tonight's update, our update function for Inez might be to say, insert uh, today's date, Fastly headquarters in, in Inez, right, as the booker. So that's like our update that we want to perform. Now, as we said, there might be a problem, right, in our application is probably incorrect for two of us to schedule an event in the same room at the same time, okay? So what we do is we're going to have a dependency check here that's going to encode our essentially semantics for, for our, our precondition for the update, which is the requested time and location should be available. And then if this dependency check fails, right, if someone else has reserved this room, I'll run a merge function, try to find another time based on alternates. So let's say we might try 5 p.m. or we might try the next day at 7 p.m. and so on, right? And this is just like, it's literally just an API that we're fulfilling, right? We're, we're filling in basically user-defined functions for each of these calls such that we'll get a desirable behavior defined according to my, you know, intention, my transaction intention when multiple users perform their updates. Does that make sense? Everyone on board? Everyone love Bayou so far? All right, yeah, this is pretty sweet because it's not read and write. You know, in a traditional database, we would only have the update function. This is augmenting sort of the semantics that the database knows about. It's still a black box, right? I don't need to know exactly what the dependency check is doing. It can be a black box, but it's going to allow me to do some cool stuff. So what's it going to allow me to do? I got my storage system here. It's pretty sweet. We've got Inez on her mobile PDA. She's on her Apple Newton, uh, you know, super excited to use it, and she can't connect to the internet. So what's she going to do? Well, she's going to perform this update on her local client and ship it to her server. In this case, this client and server are co-located. Okay? So inside this server that's not connected to the rest of the network, we're going to have our data, like a local cache copy of the database. We've got Fred, Archer's got Fastly reserved. But fortunately, right, we've got this, this write, our update function, insert for tonight at Fastly HQ. The dependency check, you know, is this date available? We look at the database. Turns out it is. We can book, we can have papers we love tonight. That's pretty, that's pretty awesome, right? So in this case, the dependency check passed. We just apply the update blindly, okay? Now at this point, we've only got the update on one server. So that kind of sucks, right? We want other people to know and hear about what, what you know, sort of um, time we chose. We want to make sure no one else chose that time as well. So we're going to ship this update to other servers. And we're going to do this essentially optimistically. So recall, we've done our update on one server. In the background, just asynchronously, doesn't matter, just opportunistically, using any number of algorithms like flooding the network uh, or, or doing something smarter, say version vectors like Bayou does, we're just going to send this around to all of the servers. So this is, this is pretty sweet. So uh, what we've got, single server, and then we're just going to propagate this around the system. All right, so everyone on board. So let's look at another example. Let's say we want to do something a little bit crazier, because I'm a crazy guy. I want to do money transfers in Bayou. So my update function would be, say, transfer $100 from Jan to Mary. And my dependency check would be, you know, does Jan have $100 in her account, right? So, I, I want to make sure that Jan has a positive account balance remaining. I'd really hate to, to burn my friend Jan and uh, leave her with an overdraft, right? Uh, and, and, you know, if there's, if there's not, you know, if this isn't satisfied, if, if I would leave her with an overdraft, I, I, I don't want to issue this, this operation, so my merge function is to be like, log the error, right? So I can come back later and say, damn, sorry, Mary, couldn't, couldn't issue that transfer for you, okay? What does this one look like? Well, uh, we've got this update function, transfer $100. So we'll perform our dependency check in the database. Does Jan have $100 in her account? The answer is yes. And so we'll actually decrement Jan's balance by 100 and add it to Marsha. So this isn't super, super interesting, um, but we can do that. And if I add another 
sort of transaction or another operation here, say transfer $100 from Jan to Peter, and perform another dependency check, does Jan have $100 in her account? Uh, we see here that if I execute it, the dependency check's not gonna pass, right? So Jan's got $10 left, I can't execute this logic. So this is like super, super, maybe this is boring, but it just illustrates that essentially depending on the order in which these arrive, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be able to sort of fulfill my transaction or my operation intent, right? So this is all good and well, it's kind of cool. We've got this sort of store procedure-like transaction model. So what, what, what's wrong with this? What's wrong with this picture? So I've got Jan over on this server, and she's generating her balance transfers, right? Sending them around sort of optimistically throughout the system. There's no real ordering guarantee behind this. If Jan's the only user in the system, that's fine, right? I mean, concurrency and sort of data corruption or, or these update conflicts occur only when there's really parallelism or concurrent users updating the same data. So if Jan's the only one in the system, this is, this is an okay picture, but we should start to get a little nervous, right, when we're allowing update anywhere, and along comes Marsha, and Marsha makes her set of updates, and oh man, so Marsha not only updated her value before, before she saw Jan's update, but this guy down in the lower right-hand corner, he also didn't take that new account, right? So we can end up in a situation where eventually we deliver all of the updates, but suddenly Greg, <laughs> And Bobby, I think that's Bobby, no, Greg and Peter, sorry, Greg and Peter, you know, are seeing essentially different states of the world, right? We apply these in different orders, we're going to get different outcomes, okay? So we've got a problem. Does everyone, does everyone see what's happening here? So what, like, what is it, this problem actually getting at? We need, we want to sort of guarantee that servers eventually agree, right? This is, this is essentially, this is just eventual consistency, right? After writes have finished, at some point in the future, we'll get the same value for every, you know, data item for every, on every server. And the way that we're going to do this is we're going to decide on sort of a stable prefix of writes. So what does that mean? I, I basically want to get a set of writes that won't change in the future. And I want to make sure that everyone agrees on that same set of writes. And we'll just keep growing that set. It's really a log, growing that log over time. So how do people today solve sort of eventual consistency? And what, what type of things do people do? Who here has heard of last writer wins? Right. All right, so last writer wins is funny. I like calling it, you know, I think it was Justin Sheehy or maybe Kyle Kingsbury who, who like calling it some write wins. And that, you know, <laughs> when there is no now in a distributed system, timestamps get very messy. But we could imagine, say, ordering writes by, by timestamp, right? In fact, sort of the, the Bayou paper has timestamp rights just to sort of identify individual updates. So you can say this is from uh, one server, this is from another server, and sort of reason about an idea of uniqueness in the system. But this, this has some drawbacks, right? So who here has probably used a last writer wins system? Okay, so there's some, there's some challenges here. Um, Bayou alle alle alleviates some of them in that, you know, we're still gonna be able to ship these merge functions around, but it's gonna have some other problems. So, so let's say we give Jan to Marsha timestamp 10. So this is awesome, like we executed this on our local replica of data, and life is, life is great. Well, remember, anyone anywhere in the system can keep making updates, literally on any server. Right? And so, you know, when we start to receive these messages, we, get, we gain connectivity again, we're gonna have to start processing these writes. And if we get another write that comes in, say our second write from before, and this guy has timestamp two, suddenly we're in a little bit of trouble, right? We have to now reorder these transactions. And in fact, the Bayou paper talks a lot about how they handle sort of this undo and rollback. So literally, if we were to do this timestamp-based um, scheduling, of, of these merge functions, we'd have to basically blow away both of these writes, essentially undo them, just like in a transactional database, reset to the initial state of the database, and subsequently replay the transactions from in, uh, their, in their timestamp order. So in this case, Jan to Marsha would fail, right? So we're essentially gonna have to go back in time, insert this thing in the log, and then replay from there. So, you know, if we have timestamp 11, 22, 28, 34, we get a 13, 
We now have to move all of these over and slot it back in, re-executing anything in the, in the future, right? So what's kind of bad about this scheme is that if I've got a client who's disconnected, like, like let's say they're disconnected for a year, <laughs> and then they come along and say, hey, I, I did an update you know, a year ago. You've kept around, first of all, you have to replay the year's worth of updates, which is gonna be really expensive. In fact, every time a new timestamp comes in, I have to reinsert and rerun, which is very expensive. And second of all, this is gonna make garbage collection really hard. So, you know, when I do a write in a normal database, I just store the latest version of a, of a data item. In Bayou, if I'm gonna have to rearrange these orders, I'm gonna have to literally store every single write operation, like command logging, uh, if you ever do that in a, in a database system. So this is very expensive. Um, it works, but it's not super practical, especially when you consider that the Apple Newton didn't have you know, tons of, of a spare disk. So Bayou instead uses essentially a master to determine ordering. Okay, so it's gonna take these servers, it's gonna designate one of them the master, so you know, Jan's lucky, she's on the master server, and we're gonna basically split the set of writes into two categories. So we're gonna have things that are tentative, so these are writes that have you know, reached our local server but haven't been ordered yet. And then we're gonna have writes that are committed. So the cool part about this is that tentative writes might be out of order, but anything that's on the committed side, at least some prefix of writes will agree for all clients in the system. And it's the master's job to decide on that ordering. It's literally, you can think of this as basically being able to choose an arbitrary ordering. Sometimes you like to do things in timestamp order. You can do like kind of causally consistent delivery if you care about it. But for our purposes, let's just think about this as deciding some order, any order. So Janicide's green, broadcast that out. Everyone's able to move their rights over to the committed state. And we can continue to do this for each of the rights. Jan is probably going to do this in, a, in arrival order. And it doesn't matter, right? So, so we can apply these commits essentially out of band, right? So, so Peter, lowly Peter, who's disconnected from the network, it's a little sad, but he's gonna be okay, because when he comes online, he'll be able to, he'll be able to just move these things over, and, it, and no one has to wait for him. So what's kind of cool about this is that we're using a, you know, a, essentially a coordination pr primitive, right? Coordination protocol. In order to get that master, we're probably gonna have to run something like Paxos or Raft or some expensive consensus protocol. But the cool thing is that while we're doing this sort of expensive operation of, of, of paying for this order, we don't really care. We're still able to make progress locally and we know at the end of the day, things are gonna be all right. All right, so any questions so far? All right, everyone's still loving Bayou? A little bit less enthusiastic. You're probably asking, well, how does this thing actually work? What guarantees do we provide? Hold that thought, we'll get to it in a second. So um, I wanna point out here, so this, uh, these updates don't have to be commutative. Like I can, it's really cool, I can put arbitrary logic into my uh, merge function and you know, it'll be executed in the same way on every server, it just might take a while. So it's very cool, it's, 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 it's literally, you, know, you can do Turing complete stuff in there. As long as it's deterministic and terminates, <laughs> you're all right. Now, we talked a lot about writes, right? This paper's mostly about writes, but you might ask, well, what about reads, right? So, you know, if I wanna check my schedule on my Apple Newton while I'm in the library, you know, what, what, what options do I have? And if you think about it, right, we split our servers into this tentative part and this committed part. And so Bayou actually exposes to the client this very cool idea, which is we're gonna let users choose where, what they read from. So you can read the stable stuff, the committed rights. If you wanna get a pristine version of the world that will not change or will only grow over time, you can do that. You may not get the latest version, but you will get a consistent snapshot of the world as of some point in time. And then if I want to you know, play a little fast and loose and I want to read something a little fresher, I can read the tentative rights. So there's a bit of a question, right? You know, why read from tentative storage at all? It seems kind of crazy. Like, it seems like by going to the tentative storage, we're, we're as bad off as we are when we read from an eventually consistent system today. So any thoughts why we have the tentative storage, why we allow that read API? Sorry? Availability. 
well, I'm still available if I read from stable storage. I might read no, but I'm available. You're right in one sense, though. Availability in terms of my own session is very important to me, right? So, so if I make an update on my phone, I'm disconnected and I can't commit, it's kind of a pain in the ass if I can't read my own rights. You know, like how many of you have like, have like posted something on Twitter or Facebook and then refreshed and you didn't see your update? So you posted another one. Who's, who's done that? Yeah. So that sucks, right? That's like a, that's, it's just like a bad user experience. In fact, one of, the, one of the things that the Bayou folks actually thought of, and this is the other sort of very exciting part of the Bayou project that I like, also led by one of my heroes, Doug Terry, is they invented this whole class of guarantees called session guarantees. One of the session guarantees is read your rights. So they essentially say if you want to you know, read your updates, you need to be able to read from tentative storage. And there's a bunch of different models you can enforce on those tentative, tentative reads that give you some, some degree of, of consistency, right, or sort of session freshness on a, on a per user basis, right? You, if you're sticky with the same server, right, you run the same server on your same device, you can always talk to it. You can observe prior history there. And so you, you, pre you preserve availability, as you mentioned, with a little bit stronger semantics, right? Like it sucks reading null all the time. It's eventually consistent, as long as you eventually read something that's not null, uh, but, but it's not very useful. In fact, there's a great survey that I'd recommend uh, called Replicated Data Consistency Explained Through Baseball. This is a very cool paper. So yeah, here's, I hear a couple, has anyone else seen this paper or read this paper? It's, it's awesome. So Doug basically walks through uh, a, like kind of a fake baseball game. He said, if you were gonna build sort of a weekly consistent system to manage the state involved, in, uh, in a ball game, what guarantees would each of, say, the umpire, the batter, um, the pitcher, need to actually observe? And it turns out the answer, not surprisingly to many of us who you know, operate these systems, you can get away with, with sort of weak guarantees a lot of the time. Right? It's always sufficient to use coordination, but sometimes we don't have to. And this is a really cool um, sort of narrative that, 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 that Doug draws. Okay. So that was kind of maybe a close reading of how we do the conflict detection and resolution in, in Bayou, but I think that Bayou really shines when we sort of take more of a comparative approach, right? So we, we compare it to existing systems like Dynamo and other transaction processing systems you may have heard of. Um, so I want to spend a little bit of time, basically the bulk of the remainder of the talk, asking what is like, like what is Bayou actually doing for us? Like why is Bayou different than just a key value store today? And Bayou is kind of secret sauce, right? That sounds nice for a system called Bayou. I think of like, you know, very soupy foods from, from, from the Bayou, maybe some good gumbo. So, so the, you know, the secret ingredient in the Bayou gumbo is that it, we're really pushing the application logic into our updates. And I would claim that for many applications in this sort of available environment, read and write, simply performing basic reads that blow away the old database state is, isn't sufficient for expressing correct programs. And let's just look at a very simple example. So we saw that we can actually preserve some degree of correctness, at least eventually, for these two updates, right, with the, with the transfers. We're not gonna end up with negative account balances. And that's awesome. Now, if we didn't have this sort of special merge API, our updates might look something like this. Write Jan equals 10, write Peter equals 42. And then write Jan equals 10, Mary equals 110, right? This is like a classic problem. If you, if you open up a database textbook, they'll say, you know, you should use transactions because of banks, right? <laughs> and this is exactly why. If all you have is read and write, if your whole programming API is just blindly overriding existing items in the database, you will run into problems where, say, we gave out $200 and we only withdrew 100, okay? Similarly, right? Even if we had a little bit more expressive API, something maybe in between, like uh, using commutative counters or something, and we just decremented Jan by 100, decremented Jan by 100, and then just did our increments, we could still run into problems where Jan here would be negative 90 for our balance, right? So, so what's really important here, why I say that Bayou's secret sauce is in pushing these application logic down in the database, is that we're really encoding not just our update logic, we're encoding sort of what it means in a very specific way in this dependency function this dependency check, exactly what it means for a conflict to occur. It's literally pushing a precondition for our update into the database along with the update itself. And there's just semantic meaning lost in these lower two APIs. So there's no free lunch, 
But if we're able to take advantage of these types of sort of programming constructs, have the system know, have the, have the programmer <laughs> actually you know, do a little bit more work and tell us what they care about, what the semantics are, we can do a lot better. And so what we're doing here, the way I like to think about this is we're capturing the transaction's intent. Right? So we're not just capturing the after effect, we're capturing what the, what the program was trying to do, what the action actually means to the system, and, and these dependency checks effectively encode preconditions. So um, has anyone programmed with things like guarded atomic actions or prolog or anything like that? Okay, a few of you, yeah. So this, you know, you can, this is like, you have a rule, and you say, only if this rule fires, right, apply my update. So if this is kind of my take on why Bayou's pretty cool, um, it's useful to think about, you know, what does it actually guarantee? So when you read a paper, you should be really skeptical and say, does this thing actually do what I think it does, what the author said it does? What are the actual guarantees that the system's providing me? And in Bayou, fortunately, uh, I, I, you know, I haven't proven the pro protocol correct, but eventually all updates are applied in the same order on all servers, right? So this is a very powerful guarantee. Basically, we do arbitrary program logic. We can or it'll order it in some arbitrary way, and we'll get the right, we'll get some right answer, or some serial execution of the updates. You guys should like be squirming in your chairs a little bit like, wait, that sounds a lot like acid transactions. That sounds a lot like, say, serializability. Like, like what's, what's going on here, right? And we can be, it, it, it's, it is, it's crazy, right? We're actually enforcing, you know, a total ordering on all of our updates. And then we're still re maintaining availability. And we're enforcing all kinds of, you know, arbitrary integrity constraints, right? Arbitrary checks in our application. So this is like too good to be true. Like, did we just beat CAP? Did we? Like, did we just do the impossible? It sounds, sounds crazy. I mean, I might, I might need to write a blog post on, on, on I should not. All right, um, <laughs> on Hacker News. Uh, but no, there's, there's, there's worse things I could say. Um, no, it, it, I mean, this stuff's very confusing. So, 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 you know, the key here, right, when you're, when you're dealing with these definitions, you're like, okay, what, what the fuck actually is the system doing? You have to be very careful. And so there's a very important word in this first sentence that we should be aware of. So, so what's the important word? Does anyone have any ideas? Eventually, yes. So if we want to know the total order, we still have to wait, right? So like these tentative reads and all, they're fantastic, but it's not, you know, magic pixie dust, right? If we actually want to know at the end of the day the affirmative, authoritative answer, just like in, say, the CAP theorem, we have to wait. We have to coordinate. And so what's actually kind of cool about this, I was, I was thinking a lot about this paper, and I said, hmm, you know, there's a lot of cool transaction processing systems, like HStore or VoltDB, has anyone heard of, or Granola, the other, there's research systems called Granola and Calvin. Has anyone heard of any of these words up here? Yeah. Did anyone go to the Calvin uh, papers we love? All right, Inez one, yeah. Calvin's like a sweet paper. Uh, I actually think it's, it, it, you know, it, uh, yeah. There's some really cool ideas in this work. Uh, but, but the cool thing about this, these are all sort of um, serializable databases, so ACID databases in the very fundamental sense, like pure ACID databases. And I say atomic broadcast because there was like some, some papers in the late 90s. Um, has anyone heard of like atomic broadcast or causal broadcast multicast systems? Yeah, so like group communication systems. So there's all these like systems that people were building. So after shared memory kind of fell apart, they said, well, well, well let's, let's just do shared memory. Let's do, let's do shared messaging. And so there's a bunch of different protocols for, for executing, say, making sure everyone gets the message in the same order. So this atomic broadcast, there's papers that, are, that have a similar smell. But the secret sauce in all of these papers, so I just, I'm going to save you like five papers to read here. The secret sauce here is that we're going to pre-schedule our transactions and then execute them in total order. So this gives us totally ordered outcomes on every replica. And you're like, holy shit, I just built a serializable database. I thought we were just, I thought we were just building an AP database, but now we turn it on its head and we can actually, I'm telling you, we can get serializability instead. And the difference between these systems, and these are like you know, cutting edge research. There's actually companies that are being formed that are, that are sort of commercializing these. VoltDB is already commercial. But the secret here is just we're taking the ordering that we moved in the background in Bayou, and we're just bringing it up to the front of the system, right? So we're putting the ordering up front. And just to give you like an idea of what one of these systems looks like, so Calvin, which is by Daniel Abadi, he's a super awesome guy at Yale. He invented column stores during his PhD thesis, like Vertica, nice chunk of change. Um, basically, it looks like this. It's a little hard to read, but um, you know, we've got our app up here. The app submits uh, stored procedures, 
essentially sim similar, almost identical to those that we're seeing in Bayou, to a sequencer. Oh man, that's pretty crazy. So it's literally a Paxos based sequencer that takes in all these store procedures, basically in a giant queue, you know, give me more transactions, give me more transactions, gets a batch of them, totally orders them, and sends them out for in-order processing on each server. It's just by you if you squint. So if you wanted to do this, right, and turn by you into asset, essentially all you have to do is give it some transaction T, create a write W, where you know your update function don't do anything. Always fail your dependency check. And then just execute the transaction in your merge, right? Now, this would give you sort of, uh, you know, transactions executed in a total order. If we want to make sure that we get the right answer, that we actually wait for the answer, we could just wait for W to commit and buy you and then notify the client of success. And in fact, that's, that's as simple as you could, you know, as you can get. What we're doing here is in buy you, we would drop st step number two, right? We wouldn't actually wait for the right to commit because we, we don't want to wait. But if you wanted to turn by into a serializable database, you could, you could actually just put that extra step in. Now, like in fairness to all of these other papers, there's actually a shitload of like system optimizations and implementation details that they like take advantage of, right? It's kind of stupid to use a master for commit if you have a partially replicated system, for instance. So there's a lot of cool tricks that they do to, to achieve high performance. But if you wanted to, just to like put this in context, if you wanted to, you could actually turn by you and do a and do a. Thing. So I see all of you are like starting to dial on your cell phone. You know, like call Doug Terry, like give me that by you source code. I'm gonna build a you know next spanner. You know, um, hold your breath. What's also kind of cool with this, um, and this is just a paper that I that I really like that came out recently. This is also from from Daniel Abadi, one of my sort of heroes at Yale. Um, this is pretty crazy. So imagine you're in this system like by you, right? If you don't care about tentative reads. Why execute the transactions at all? So I can just queue up a bunch of writes. I've got them to store procedures. I'm literally going to take lazy evaluation, just like in a functional programming language. I'm going to evaluate the transactions on demand. It's a crazy idea. Like normally we just are like, shit, I got to finish these transactions. I got to do these transactions before I commit. I, I got to make sure it's on disk before it happens. Like no, all you got to do, log that store procedure, don't execute it. Only when, you need to, only when you need to read it, you can actually, uh, do you need to execute it. And it's, it's just like, it's like a really brilliant idea. It's a little bit harebrained, but like this is why we do research. And so it's a cool paper to check out if that sounds, if that sounds nuts. But it's like lazy functional evaluation meets databases, which is just like mind blown. All right, so <laughs> we eventually have to wait. That kind of sucks, right? Um, it's just a trade-off. It's a fundamental trade-off. If we want sort of a total order, and we care about the outcome of the program, we're going to have to wait. And this leads to some kind of awkward stuff. So for those of you who read the paper, like there's some kind of funny sentences here. Like, all right, we made a meeting room, or we made a meeting room scheduling program. But you know, you, we can't actually like, decide or vote in this application, right? Because that would require waiting. So you know, it's OK if you've decided that you want to meet in a certain room. And you've already decided what times you care about, right? It doesn't help you determine a mutually agreeable place and time for the meeting. So that, like, like that kind of like it'll, you'll reserve a room, you will get a room eventually that is either the room you requested or one of the alternatives. But like that decision of like coming to consensus about what room you wanted, like it's kind of out of scope here. Like you could do it, right? You know, you can make like you can make like pipe run MapReduce if you if you really want to. Um, but but like it's not really a natural fit here. So there's some semantics that that are fundamentally going to require sort of waiting here. And there's an interesting question, like, when can we avoid waiting at all? Right, so when, for instance, would tentative reads make sense? So just a, you know, this is a little bit of a whirlwind tour, but, you know, the paper discusses that, for instance, if my logic is commutative, I can just put it in the log and it's fine. Right, so like if I'm, if we're all just giving money to, to, to Fastly, right, we're all just like donating, 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 and like that's not going to cause any integrity constraint violations, then we'll just like put it in the log and say be done with it, right, we don't have to wait for it to commit. And the paper talks about this, this is like a well-known trick. Um, quick note on commutativity, so who here has like heard of like why commutativity rocks and it's, it's like a super useful concept? Awesome, yeah, it does rock, and it is a super useful concept. But you have to be careful when you apply commutativity. So like commutative logic, so this idea of like my merge functions, which encode my program invariants are, are, are you know, being commutative, is very different than the idea of having commutative data types, right? So 
There's a lot of work that's super useful on, on sort of making sure that, say, when I decrement a counter and you decrement the counter, we end up with a sort of consistent outcome that reflects our operations. But that doesn't mean that the operations themselves in the context of the program are, are correct. So just to give this example, like, we can make this decrement, decrement commutative, but it turns out that, like, when we actually look at the program, whether or not we actually wanted to do decrements depended on uh, some state that wasn't commutative, right? So we have to be really careful t about when we, when we employ this sort of order and sensitivity. And, um, like, this is super useful. Uh, I'm super excited to see databases adding these types of data types as, like, a first-class primitive, but they don't always ensure correctness. So that's a little bit oblique. Um, Ask me questions at the talk. I read a blog post on this a little bit, but I think it's very, very important to realize that like Bayou works not because we push down a little bit of the application. Like you literally shove the whole uh, update logic into the app or into the system, right? All right. So we have commutative logic. We're okay. Just be careful what we might commutative. Um, there's some work by my colleague, so Peter Alvaro, who presented I think two months ago, has this thing called the Calm Theorem, which basically says if our if our log if, you know, if our logic is monotonic and it basically means like the program state only grows over time, we never retract facts. It's like, well, if we're like literally only adding things to the log, we never change the value of anything we wrote before. Sounds kind of like immutability. Then we don't need to wait for commit. So this gives you determinism despite different ordering. And actually, Lindsay Cooper has a nice thesis on this topic um, uh, about these things called LVARs. And then uh, some of my work is basically asking, you know, can we give sort of guarantees on intermediate reads? So we've got this thing you can read about called iConfluence that says um, if this condition is, you know, is met, we can guarantee sort of safe outcomes with respect to your dependency functions uh, while still guaranteeing convergence, right? So there's, there's like a range of criteria, I would say. This is sort of like, like life after Bayou. Right, where they said, you know, like the paper discussed this one. That's like kind of cool, right? Commutativity is cool. There's like a cool bunch of cool theses from from MIT. This guy William Vile, who now does green computing at Google. Like uh, back in the day, he was like hardcore distributed systems and databases guy. He spent a lot of time on this. And then recently, there's been a lot of interest in sort of understanding when we can avoid that because fundamentally that master kind of sucks, right? It kind of sucks having to having to pay that that coordination cost. The master's down. We have to wait. So it's often nice to avoid waiting at all and just read tentative and know it's committed. All right, running a little short on time, so I'll go quickly through, through the rest. Um, what about immutability, right? So as Pat Helen would say, immutability changes everything. It's actually a great talk. Uh, you should find it online. Uh, he's got a paper now on it, too, uh, in, in upcoming in, in January. So Bayou stable log, right, is, is immutable, right? So like once we've committed something, we can't go back and throw, throw away any of the records in it. So it's just it's like the same trick, right? Like event sourcing, lambda architecture, like whatever you want to call this, this pattern. It's like super useful. Just log, log the transaction intent, and then you know, as long as you agree not to change it in the future, then you can just execute it. So it's, it's just like a very common pattern that you know, is very, very early in the literature. Now the one caveat here that I would say is we have to be careful what, what, gar what guarantees we make about the outcomes in the log, right? So again, if I'm, say, issuing concurrent withdrawal requests, making these withdrawal requests immutable or logging sort of these immutable events doesn't guarantee that I'm going to win, right? That I'm going to be able to get my withdrawal request processed. It just means that we're not going to fuck up according to whatever we pushed in the application, right? So in a sense, the immutability part's kind of kind of the easy bit here, right? It's just like make sure you log this stuff and then come up with a way to totally order it. But reasoning out the outcomes is actually a bit of a challenge. And, and, what, and the, you know, the real problem here, or the real kind of open question is when we, when we can't wait, but we need to get an answer, right? Like let's say we're actually running an ATM and we don't know, you know what the other actors in the system are doing, how do we build systems that, that are able to provide a safe response? So another question. So why, like, it's kind of like, I love this paper, but as I was reading, I, I, I kept asking myself, like, why, is, why do we have this merge? Like, what, what's going on with this merge? It's very, very strange. Like, why not just ship store procedures and re-execute them? Right, so we've got like this three functions. It's a little bit, did anyone think this was like a little bit kludgy, like when, we, when, when I presented it? Maybe not. Okay, you haven't like reading this paper every day for the last week. I actually, yeah. <laughs> To their credit, I like it a lot, but, but you know, you, you got to ask, like, why the fuck didn't they just write this? 
Like, if Jan has $100, transfer the money. Otherwise, log the error. Like, it's just, it, it's a, like, you ship a function, right? You don't care what it is. You can just ship a black box. And, and I think, you know, to be fair, like, this is like 1994. So, they make some claim in the paper, like, it's really expensive to spin up a tickle interpreter every time we want to evaluate merge, right? So like if we want to run a, a black box, we have to spin up the tickle interpreter. It's probably gonna you know overload the Newton, and drain the battery. I don't know. I mean it's like a serious issue apparently in 1994. But I think like if I were to write this paper again, I would actually just say you know just ship a stored procedure. It's okay, um, and uh, you know it, life will be. I mean it's little. It's like just sugar, right? But um, you know, when we talk about merge functions in other contexts, like you may have heard of them in like these commutative data types, they're much, mu they have much different meaning, right? They're actually like sort of some, some system designer said, here's how you should write a counter, and here's how you merge together counters, right? This is literally just like merge functions listed in these black box. It's like, this means like insert or update, dependency check means black box, merge function means black box. I just say, you can think of this as just put it all in a box. And there's a cool paper called Eventually Serializable Data Services by uh, Nancy Lynch. So, like, uh, FLP, Nancy Lynch, proof of the cap theorem, Nancy Lynch, that basically says, oh, you could build a database just, just by doing this. It's kind of the same idea of sort of building an eventually, uh, you know, it's not, it's serializable, but if you do reads in, the, in their interim, you're going to get garbage data out. So it's, it's a very similar idea. Um, all right, another paper I love. Uh, it's kind of funny. Uh, my, one of my colleagues, Neil Conway, actually wrote a whole paper basically saying, if all you're doing is shipping kind of uh, the not exactly store procedures, but imagine you're shipping around these logs, right, this event log exchange. It'd be very nice if you knew when you could garbage collect pieces of data, right? Not just like the update functions themselves as in Bayou, but like let's say I wrote something, it's immutable so I can't like overwrite it. I'd like to like, you know, eventually throw it out, otherwise just keep growing my data forever. And so there's some really cool language work that, that, that Neil did that's very practical that basically asks, um, comes with automated techniques for, for sort of reclaiming data. So this is an awesome paper. I'd encourage you to check it out. Um, last thing, uh, so dur what about durability, right? This is the one thing that doesn't really come up in the cap theorem, for instance. Like when we're building these available services, it's like, oh, update on your phone. It's fine. Like just update locally and then throw the phone into the street and it's going to run over by cars. And hopefully you can retrieve your flash drive because, you know, um, you know, your data was on it and you didn't replicate it anywhere, right? It's kind of a problem. Like there, there is an overhead associated with making this stuff durable that, that deserves attention. The paper doesn't spend too much time on it, but I would claim, and this is sort of my, uh, a bit of a polemic, is that you know, durability and consistency are sort of orthogonal, right? So durability says, you know, if you want to survive F faults, you need F plus one server. So if I want to survive one fault, I better put this somewhere else. And then, you know, if I want something like strong consistency or serializability, we usually require something like a majority of servers, right? So totally, in Bayou, local updates where f equals zero, Bayou is essentially f equals zero, right? You can't tolerate a single failure or lose data. Um, but, but the point here is that I can put data in Bayou essentially on any server I want, and it'll be fine, right? So, you know, if I want to have more, more durability in an update anywhere system, I'll just get like a backpack of PDAs that I replicate to, okay? <laughs> like, like, I can do that, but, but like, you know, Let's say I, so I've got one and I've got like five in my backpack, maybe like one in my skateboard. But, but the thing is, in order to get strong consistency, right, I just added like five more nodes to the system. So, so it's still not like the durability overhead in terms of communication is fixed, right? It's like I want F, I need F plus one. The communication overhead and the coordination overhead for strong consistency is like I better get to that master or I better have a majority. So one is constant, the other one scales in the cluster size, okay? So it's worth keeping in mind. So I think it's like, you could, you could harp on the paper for like, man, what about data loss? Like, you sound like MongoDB, and it's like, no, 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 just chill out. Um, it's not that big of an issue. All right, so uh, who here knows Dynamo? All right, so I'll do this really quick. Just, just like for some context, this is a super influential system. I think a lot of the same ideas appear in Dynamo. Merge functions are a little bit different. Uh, basically, Bayou is fully replicated, so like every server has all the data. You're at web scale, it's probably not going to work. You're going to be sad panda. So you're going to do what's called partial replication, where you split your data up, and life will be OK. Uh, it's actually kind of hard to do partial replication. Like, imagine you're shipping these logs between, say, data centers, right? You now need to replay the log in parallel. 
and you want to do it in some ordering, ordered fashion. Like, so you want to maintain session guarantees, like read your writes, or say everyone writes arrive in order. Like, that's actually a hard problem. People have, people have studied this, but it's, it's doable, right? There's some challenges there. Um, Bayou gives you update one, like you can literally just update your phone and throw it in the street. Uh, Dynamo gives you flexibility. You can update you know, any number. It's, it's essentially tunable. Uh, Bayou in this paper, anti-entropy is like basically shipping in order on a per server basis. Right, so like I make update one, update two, update three. You're gonna get update one, two, three. It's just like a, a tweak, but Dynamo makes a makes a very cool point. Like at scale, when you've got like terabytes of data on every node, you don't want to like send it one, two, three. You get that? You get that? You, you know, it's like like you're running like multi-core server, right? You actually might care about about getting some parallels in there. Um, Dynamo uses this cool thing called Merkle trees, where it computes a hash. And then it builds a tree of hashes. And so you just go down that tree and say, where do I differ? Where do I differ? Anytime I differ, I can go down and just know exactly which branch I should ship. Um, Bayou does a server-side merge because it pushes the client code down to, down to the actual server. Right? So like the update function is actually not right. It's like this giant hairball of basically stored procedure. And then Dynamo, it's like, nah, man. You do it on your own time. Like I'm gonna just gonna I'm just gonna like barf a bunch of concurrent writes to you, and you're gonna give me back one. And it'll be it'll be copacetic, right? So so it's a little bit different. There's some efficiency challenges, but you know, imagine like tickle TK is pretty cool, but I want to write my merge function in Python. You know, you might want to go with the client side merge. Um, Bayou has this idea of global stability detection. So essentially, like we have this master that's deciding when we've seen stuff and. Basically, Dyn and we can say, hey, did this thing commit yet? Did this thing commit yet? Did this commit yet? Like, it's actually very useful. Dynamo doesn't really have any notion of stability. It's kind of like, I'm going to spray your data around with some nodes. It'll be cool, and like, eventually the right thing's going to happen. But it's not very um, clean when it comes to asking, did it hit all my replicas? It just says, ah, you, you, you know, you, I wrote to five nodes, right? They might have been the ones that were your replica. And you know, eventually we'll fix it. But it doesn't, it, you can't query for that. And then the last thing is um, Bayou doesn't really give you strong consistency for, for updates. I can't do read, modify, write unless if I block like I talked about. And Dynamo gives you kind of this weird um, uh, quorum-based semantics. All right, so uh, that was most of the talk. I, I think it's worth kind of finishing up. Any questions before I, before I finish up? All right. Uh, so, like, what did we learn? Like, why do why do I think you know people should read Dynamo? Um, you know, a lot of the ideas kind of in NoSQL, right? Rethinking what consistency means, letting the application do a little bit more of the heavy lifting is is is, is I think can trace its way back to to Bayou. And kind of the answer here is we have to involve the applications if we want to get correct data. We look at our goals, handle frequent disconnections. You basically just Embrace update anywhere. Like you kind of have to do that if you want to guarantee availability. Reads about distribution explicitly. We're going to require the app to do some more work. And this conflict detection and resolution is all about using these merge and dependency APIs. Okay. So it's a pretty nice set of techniques that, have, that we see you know, in practice today. So to leave things on like a little bit more of a you know, maybe philosophical note, um, I think it's worth thinking about you know, what does Bayou mean for the user? What is this, what, like, we essentially simplified a lot of things in, the, in our design, but whenever we simplify, we take something away. And so Bayou makes this point. It's kind of an offhanded remark. You know, weekly consistent replication has been used previously for availability, simplicity, and scalability in a variety of systems. And indeed, it has and it continues to be used. But, but I want to ask, you know, simplicity, like what do we mean by simplicity? So is it simplicity for whom? So it's certainly simple for the architects, right? We just say, hey, anti-entropy, like, just spray that shit, you know? Life's good. Just keep sending. Uh, it's good for the people who have to build the system, right? You don't just have, you know, these Xerox Park guys hanging out and say, yeah, you know, it'd be cool if we commercialize this. And, you know, they say, oh, it's great. All I have to do is just, like, you know, use, you know, TCP multicast. Um, so it's good for them. It's good for the system operators. That you don't get paged in the middle of the night when you build a system that says, you can update anywhere. Just don't expect anything from, from your tentative reads. But, but like these are all sort of like internals infrastructure people, right? What does it mean for application writers? What does it mean for users? And there's a very tangible cost. Like anyone writing an application on top of one of these systems who wants to get correct data needs to inform the system in some way that they're at what their application needs. Bayou gives you the interface. In fact, it's one of the best set of interfaces that I've seen for completely specifying sort of application invariance and what an update actually intends to do. 
So it's a huge success in that regard, but we have to acknowledge the fact that this is by no means a simple system for our end users to reason about. I think it's considerably better than the systems that we have today, right, where we can use, say, last right or wins or some right wins and cross our fingers and sometimes we get the right answer. And if we're very careful and clever, we can, we can get the right answer, but we don't have the same system support for it. So I think it's important to kind of think about what that balance is in the APIs we design versus you know, what makes our lives easier. And, and just to make this clear, like, unfortunately, these are sort of perennial challenges, right? Your ACID database actually does the same thing, right? It turns out when you turn on, say, Oracle, it's not actually giving this nice guarantee. It, they turn out they want to go faster, and they drop, and they play fast and loose, and you get things like recommitted and snapshot isolation, which are, like, you know, basically a big, like, FU in terms of usability. So this isn't, like, a strictly, you know, eventual consistency rant. This is generally, like, these are hard problems between concurrency and usability. And in fact, unfortunately, when we're running in systems like this, it's not always a choice, right? If we don't want to pay the cost of the speed of light, like, you know, your SOL, like, you know, you're essentially dealing with relativity here. You're going to have to deal with the idea that, that some of this is, you know, you know, it's going to be concurrent, right? Literally, I can go around the globe seven and a half times in a second. That's it. If I want to do more than that, if I want to facilitate global scale services, I sometimes have to make these choices and my users are going to have to deal with it. Or I'm going to have to work more closely with my application developers. In fact, I think one of the reasons why we've seen NoSQL take off, it's been essentially a very tight coupling or tighter coupling than in the past where we like kick some shareware, shrink wrap over the fence and trust users to use it. In fact, it's, you know, these, these web services like Google and Amazon coming up with the very early NoSQL designs you know, their app developers would come and talk to them and say, hey, this merge function thing, it's not really working out for me. And they say, oh, well, you know, you gotta make this more, you gotta make this commutative or so on, right? So there's this tight coupling and, and, and sometimes we can't, we have to, you know, we have to pay this cost. All right, another, another kind of, I'm gonna get even more spacey, like, uh, so, you know, there's 2.6 billion internet users in 2013. There's 7.1 billion humans on planet Earth as of 2013. And so at a certain level, like, we might scratch our head and say, like, well, you know what, fuck this coordination stuff. Like, we're, like, factor of three off from peak internet. <laughs> like, that's kind of crazy, right? Like, and, like, think about this. Like, how many actions can a user do in a, in a second, right? Even if you're, like, on, like, StarCraft, right? You're probably, like, you know, couple actions a second, right? And these people are, like, pros, literally pro gamers, right? Um, so in a sense, it's like maybe a little bit, you know, like why do we care about all of it? Like, oh, fortunately, we can put all of that by you, all of that eventual consistency stuff behind us, right? That's like life is good. Just gonna, you're just going to drop some spanner and, and life's going to be great. But I think actually, you know, data is going to keep increasing. And the answer is that it's not going to be due to humans, right? So, uh, you know, it's not a secret like IoT is like a, a thing. But I think it's worthwhile thinking about what like what is by you in the next 20 years going to look like. And the fact of the matter is, like today, like I get pissed when I like get on my phone and I get like in reply to null on my smartphone. Like I've literally written papers where in the conference talk, this is like the motivation. Like this is fucked up. We should like give people session guarantees to fix this, right? Like whole papers on this, right? But like what's really fucked up is like if I've got like my smart car and I'm like, should I merge? Should I merge? Should I merge? Like, I actually give a shit about availability and I care about consistency in a way that, like, you know, like, I love Cliff Moon's tweets. Like, they're, they're just, you know, you should follow this guy. He's hilarious. But, like, I care more about, like, getting to work and not crashing, right? So I think this, these issues are only going to continue. And, and what's really cool here, kind of coming back to the beginning, is that, like, by studying these old problems in, in a new light or in, like, the current context and where we're moving, we can borrow a lot of techniques and not have to reinvent so many of them, right? We can learn, like, hey, that Doug Carey guy, like, he was, he was pretty smart. He told us about, like, pushing this stuff down to our, to our uh, systems, right? And learning how to build systems that incorporate the application demands. So, brief tour of the rest of Bayou. This was one paper. Talks a lot about update conflicts. There's a session guarantees paper. That's, that's pretty rad. Uh, actually, you know, it's nice to read your rights, as we all agreed. Um, if you're interested in this anti-entropy stuff, there's a whole paper on a bunch of different algorithms, how to do this quickly, efficiently, incrementally. And there's a really nice overview paper um, essentially talking about uh, the goals of the project in a very, like, sort of executive summary. This one's six pages. So if you're like, man, this Bayou stuff, I'm so jazzed, I can't sleep. You're, like, up at night, you know, trembling. Like, there are so many great ideas in the literature I didn't even know about. Start with this one. It's good. Um, 
Last thing, last thing. Uh, so this paper, I don't know if you noticed, it's came out of Xerox Palo Alto Research Center. So who here has heard of Xerox Park? All right, yeah. So this is like the papers we love, crowd. These are like, you're like my people. Um, so, so like what came out of Xerox Park? Does anyone know anything? The user interface, correct. Well, user interface featuring windows and icons operated with a mouse. Sorry? That was not Xerox Park. So they had them. We can. Man, you're going down the. Are you on Wikipedia? Because I was on Wikipedia earlier. Okay, so, so yeah. So we got like laser printers, the GUI with the mouse, right? So yeah, there's not not the first GUI, but it's the GUI with the mouse, WYSIWYG, um, PostScript. Like God forbid, you know. Pre-PDF, it's pretty, like, whenever you find an old paper on the internet, you download, it's like a P dot PS, you open it up, it's like converting, 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 you get a PDF, it's like, you know it's the good stuff. Because someone's still, because it's like, it's like 2014, right? And someone's still posting PostScript to the internet, right? So either it's like from like before God on like some FTP server, like doesn't even have a, like literally you don't, like you don't even have like a URL, it's like Google has indexed the IP address, you know, FTP colon whatever the fuck IP address, then something dot PS, you're like, this is gold. Okay, so, so, so that came out of Park, Ethernet, uh, Smalltalk, Model View Controller, and then naturally, let's hear it for Bayou, right? Bayou came out of Park, all of this work. Thank you, yeah. Mo mo moment of silence. So, 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 you know, I think this is fantastic. Like, it's just a, it, this is really forward-looking research coming out of Xerox, of all places, right? So this is like such a non-commercial, forward-looking research where these people are saying, how can we reinvent, reinvent and re-envision sort of the future of computing systems? And what's really cool is that, you know, there's been a, there's been a history of these. So there's Xerox Park. There's a thing called DEC SRC, which is kind of a, one of the uh, successors of Xerox Park. And then there was Microsoft Research Silicon Valley. And you had people like Leslie Lamport, Chuck Thacker, uh, Butler Lampson, all of them doing work here, doing fantastic work just like Bayou. And they'll leave you on a bit of a sad note, and I don't know how many of you know this, but Microsoft Research actually recently closed its doors in Silicon Valley several months ago. And I think it's a little bit sad. I mean, I'm in academia, so academia will continue to fly the freak flag of future looking research, right? Non-product oriented research. But I think it's a little bit sad there's not really a home for this type of work in the Bay Area right now. I mean, there are industrial research labs, but really MSR, Silicon Valley campus, was the premier destination over the past several years. It did fantastic work on things like Dryad Link. It basically invented differential privacy in the early 2000s. And just a fantastic group of people who were really innovating, and now essentially there's no home for this, this product, for, you know, non-product oriented research in Silicon Valley right now. So I think it's a big question, who's gonna fill those shoes? All right, what can we learn? So more positive note, we learned something tonight, right? Learning, learning is great, even though we might not get any more papers uh, like this in the, in the near future. So integrating application logic is really key to correctly executing these systems. Uh, if we don't have these application-specific mechanisms, it's basically a recipe for data corruption. Right? There's all sorts of bad things that can happen. Uh, maybe we care, maybe we don't, but if we want to build usable systems, there's, it's nice to provide them APIs like merge and repair. And I think on the research horizon, right, so toward that more future-looking research, right, we're continuing in academia, your tax dollars at work, including paying my salary, so, so don't grumble too much when you, when you get your, uh, you know, tax bill in, in April, uh, is that, you know, we have alternatives and new research tools like, like languages like Bloom or analyses like the iConfluence stuff that can help limit this overhead. So the future is bright. We can learn from the past. And thank you all for being such a wonderful audience. I apologize, I went over. I'm probably keeping everyone from the after party. We could probably get, you take a drink break, but I can, I can answer questions. Well, people get refills if you're interested. Yeah. Uh, so you talked about a general class of databases where you end up one way or another shipping your application logic to the server. Uh, from a practical perspective, can you say what do you think the operating server is uh, API or application logic is that you yeah, exactly. So like, how do we actually ship store procedures practically today? 
Um, I think if you look at systems like Spark um, and some of the exciting work in the Scala community, there's this PhD student um, who has this thing called Spores, which will be in Scala, to one of the future Scala releases. You can basically ship closures, right? You can think about basically shipping an anonymous function around to your servers to execute there. And that's basically, um, you know, already supported. It's a little bit, it's a little bit hacky without proper language support, but that's supported in on the JVM today, right? So that that that's really cool way of doing it. The Volt DB folks, right, who actually have commercialized a product that uses store procedures, or at least historically did. Um, they use a similar approach where you write your store procedure in Java. It's like, actually it's funny, um, I think Mark Callahan, uh, who does like database at Facebook, described as like, you know, party in the front, uh, no, 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 business in the front, party in the back. So they've got like Java in front and C++ in the back, uh, on, the, on their back end to execute this stuff. Um, so yeah, anything that you can ship a closure is good. I mean, you could come with some embedded language if you want to, but that kind of like starts to suck. Um, I'd basically look to like, I mean, if you look at the way that like the Spark people have handled um, like shipping Python, or they have like PySpark. You, the problem is you get these larger binaries. So um, like the Bayou paper even complains about this too. Like the merge functions, you have like, you know, like Bayou.h, and you like statically link against Bayou.h, you know, avoiding DLL hell, and then you ship this huge. So there's like, there's like, you know, engineering challenges to making that practical, but the short answer is ship closures, and it supports it, or anywhere you can hack it. Is LLVM is like totally uh, awesome as well. You could, you could. I mean, Impala does that does that today, right? For for their runtime query uh, generation. So, yeah, it's a good question, and I think that's actually a big barrier. Like Volt for a while, I don't think supported store supported non-store procedures, and people were like, well, you have to pre-declare everything. And when you think about it, like the vast majority of your queries and your transactions are probably parameterized store procedures. They might be written in Ruby. They might be sitting in a you know Ruby virtual machine or like in your Django stack. But they're like they're repetitive. If you can factor those out, like you know life is good. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. So, uh, I like the present. So, I like the presentation, but um, you know, would it, does it stand the test of time today? Or uh, test of time is different. So, I think it stands the test of time. But would it be accepted today as is? Um, I'll say Doug Terry, who until recently was actually at Microsoft Research Silicon Valley, and was continuing this line of work, had a had a has had a number of successful papers. We so had a SOSB paper, I don't know if it's OSDI or SOSB this year, but he's had basically top tier uh, systems co conference papers uh, in the past two years on consistency, you know, SLAs for these types of systems. And it's really cool work. Like Doug's work, these types of consistency SLAs are now part of the Azure storage platforms. Like, so look at Impact from SVC. Doug's got it, and, and you know, it's shipping in product today. Um, so you know, I think this type of work is still super relevant. You know, you change the motivation, right? You're not going to say, I mean, there's a funny, like, in, in the paper they say, like, you know, you wouldn't want to turn on your Wi-Fi in the, in the library because there are going to be student hackers. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> I wasn't sure if that was a joke or if someone was, like, really cranky. But um, uh, that's all, yeah. So, um, you know, that probably wouldn't fly today. But, it, you, you know, you swap around the words, right? All of the problems uh, persist. Um, I do think in terms of style, the evaluations of this period don't really stand the test of time super well. Like, to convince someone that your system's a good idea, it's often awesome to just, like, bombard them with ridiculous performance numbers. Like, bajillion transactions per second, you know? And people say, oh my god, like, how did you do that? I gotta read the rest of this paper. Like, some people who, like, literally start papers by reading graphs. Like, they don't even read the intro, they're just like, graph, 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 caption, graph, caption. Like, I know people who do this, and, and, and I think, you know, the SOSP community very much values that quantitative uh, rigor, if we were to be, uh, uh, diplomatic. Um, I don't think Bayou. I don't think Bayou has that uh, for this paper. Uh, and in fact, like I more or less skipped the eval section when I read this one because, like, you know, I don't really care. And uh, I believe there are engineering things you could do to make it faster. I don't know. So it wouldn't be accepted today. But you could change a few words, run some more experiments, put it on Node.js. You know, and <laughs> and you know, it's, it's all it's all good. Yeah, it's a great question.
Yeah, that's a, so yeah, that's a great question. Basically, why give them a toolbox when we can give them like widgets so that they can compose like commutative counters and sets and all this stuff? Yeah. So I think it's like I think that's the right step, and I think that building commutative counters like say React 2.0 shipped with, like saves you from shooting yourself in the foot in some really like just kind of painful ways. Like I wrote to a cell and you wrote to a cell, and suddenly we ended up with you know garbage, right? Um, so I think it's progress. The, the, you know, the real challenge here that I see, and uh, Peter Alver actually gave a keynote at, at, at Recon like this, just a few months ago about this, is composing these structures is a real challenge, right? So just because individual structures are consistent and reflect the operations we wanted to perform, understanding what happens when we like, you know, say add from one set, remove to another, like, that's kind of an open problem. And, and the reason why I think it's an open problem is that the API, if all we care about is single, single you know, data structures, it's, it's not expressive enough to capture some of that um, application logic. So I think there's a, there's a set of use cases where they help. They certainly help more than giving people last write or wins registers. Um, but again, you're going to be subject to some problems when you have arbitrary code that's interacting with these. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, there's this question like, what is like the industry academic complex? Like, what does that like look like, right? Or what's that? So, okay, I'll, I'll first point out and say, like, when there are industrial papers from from people like Google and Facebook and uh, Amazon, Amazon famously released Dynamo, and I think there's kind of a bit of a gag on on future papers. Unfortunately, there was one on how they use TLA, which is actually a cool cool paper. But that's like that's basically it. But um, that practice of just talking about, like, here's one problem, right? I had to build a database, had to fit on a bunch of servers, and here's our application, and this shit we tried broke. Like, that's super valuable, and I think I would love to see more papers like that. Like, an honest discussion of what was hard and what you did to fix it, and basically, you know, kind of opening up, like, like, you know, it's nice for me to be able to just, like, take Bart down here and hang out with all of you, right? But, like, there's, like, you know, thousands of people in, in academia who can't so easily get, get access to developers. So I think there's a serious value in, research, you know, research papers, like, or industrial research papers from, you know, Fastly, right? <laughs> Write a paper on Fastly CDN. It'd be awesome, right? And actually, these, these, these conferences, including like uh, at least NSDI and these systems conferences, certainly all the database conferences have a particular track for this. And, and I think I would love to see more of that. So before I go into academia, like there is awesome stuff to do in industry. I think the applied stuff is important. It is relevant. And as like I think the issues people are facing today actually deserve you know, full treatment in the literature so, so you know, we can hear the problems and then, then start, then, then, then comes to the, how we close this loop. But so write more papers, write industrial papers. I'd love to see more of them. Um, that said, so what does it mean to like do research and like commercialize it and so on? Like essentially, so this is just my take. I, you know, I don't want to solve today's problems necessarily. Um, you know, you all are much better engineers and product managers and architects than I am, right? And you have more resources to, to do those types of activities. So, you know, the way I see it is there's like a bunch of kind of open problems, like, like how do, when do we have to coordinate, for instance? And there's a bunch of problems that matter to you all or that potentially will matter in the next five to 10 years. And it's my job, or I take it upon myself, uh, as a applied, computer science researcher, right? I, I do systems to kind of identify problems in that intersection, okay? So it's, you know, systems for a plausible future, 
That's the way I like to think about it. And so, you know, towards that end, my research is, is a success when the problems we anticipate or the problems we solve are actually become applicable. And when a, when a piece of research becomes applicable, you know, sometimes people just take it up and implement it. Like, if someone wants to implement some of my algorithms, like, let's talk. I'd love you to write, you know, I'd love if you would write my production quality code. Um, but, but, you know, sometimes you, you have to take that extra step. So, you know, would someone have picked up the C store idea or the, the, the column store idea had Mike Stonebreaker not ran with it, gotten his VC buddies and his, you know, sort of group of, um, management executives and engineers together to actually like make a company out of that? Like, I don't know, but, but commercializing the research is a surefire way to at least, it's, not a, it's certainly not a surefire way to success, but it's a surefire way to at least um, get commercial validation or try to you know, see if the idea succeeds in the real world, right? And I think what you see is like a lot of students will do a thesis, like a body's thesis was on column stores. Theses, theses take like five, six years on average. So, you know, you have this idea, you like flesh it out, you look at it like from a bunch of different directions. There's a really funny like, uh, I don't know if you guys have seen this comic, but like doing a PhD thesis, like this ball of knowledge, and you have like a little pimple that you make that like expands the ball of knowledge. <laughs> so like, but you know, so you incubate it, and you know, if it comes out at the end of the PhD, and it, it comes, turns out like the assumptions you made, it makes sense, and commercializing it makes a lot of sense. Um, but I don't think, you know, you, like the PhD, for sure, and academia in general is like not the place to be to make money, right? There are people who have a very successful careers commercializing their research, but ultimately, I think the people who are happiest are the ones who just kind of want to think about interesting problems. And as a systems researcher, I want to researcher. I want to find things that are interesting to me and interesting to you know what I perceive to be you know future challenges. Yeah, it's a little bit vague, but. Uh, I mean, you can't, like, I think we should have that in society. Like, it's kind, of, it's kind of, like, fucking awesome that we have people who, like, literally study just, like, I mean, like, in, like not insane, but, like, you know, things basically no practical value. Like, we can't, we can't monetize, like, um, I don't, practical is harsh, but, like, projects that we can't monetize are still worth worth working on, right? What, whether it's because they're so, too far out, like like there's an article in New Yorker like about graphene, like graphene's like awesome, like one of the strongest materials on the planet. We still have no way how to like actually scale it up, make transistors and so on, but like let's do that in the hopes that it might become valuable someday. And then also like there's, you know, a lot of cool people in academia who like do like critical theory and it's like what is like the human condition? Like what does Foucault have to say about like power and how does that apply to like, you know, modern society? Like that's, that's like that's like beautiful that as a, you know, as a society, we support that. So, I, I, but, but as an applied systems researcher, I feel a little bit of um, uh, obligation at, at some point to, to, to answer some the practical questions as well. So, I have a question for you guys. Did you like Bayou? Who here would, who here would read the Bayou paper uh, again or, or would, would read the Bayou paper? Okay, cool. Cool. So, uh, yeah, APIs rock. And, uh, yeah, thanks for, thanks for coming out. Oh, you have another, oh, there's another question. You know, I, I actually don't know. Um, I was thinking about this, like, oh, no, I mean, it's not, it's not my paper, right? Like, like, but yeah, but like the sauce, like, I, I was actually pretty proud of that, like the sauce. Um, but, uh, you know, one of the things that, like, kind of, like, I think the anti-entropy name is pretty funny. Like, it's, like, this physical process. You know, like, I think, I don't know who it was, like, Matt, was it Max? One of these physicists who, like, thought about, like, thermodynamics and entropy and, like, you have this little demon in a box. Who is that? Holtzman. Boltzmann. Boltzmann. Thank you. Yes, that shows my, shows my physics. Um, electron. Okay, so it's Max. So I'm vindicated. Uh, Maxwell, Maxwell is a demon. Uh, but, but, you know, like, uh, so it's like a very physical uh, metaphor, and what's kind of cool is like the first paper on sort of gossip, or um, or one of the first papers on gossip is like epidemic algorithms and a weekly consistent something something something. But you know, first of all, it's using like epidemiology, which is awesome. But but one of the people who um, who did that is this guy Scott Shanker, uh, and Scott Shanker is like he's commercialized. He's, he he was the, he founded Nasira. He's all behind SDN, uh, but he started off as a physicist. 
And so I wonder, I actually sent him an email like in the middle of the night one time, and I was like, did you invent anti-entropy because you're a physicist? Like, like is that, what's the connection? Um, uh, I don't think I got the response on that one, but, um, but Scott's a very nice guy. Um, but yeah, so that, but I think that's like, the, that one I can, you know, point to a nice metaphor, but by you, I'm not sure, maybe like the ebb and flow of the tide, you know, or maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe the servers are like the, the cool boats they drive down there, I don't know, um, yeah. Uh, I will say, you know, if you have questions on this, I, like Doug Terry is an awesome guy. Uh, he's still around. Shoot him an email. Yeah. If you, pardon? I'm actually not sure where he is. Um, yeah. Looking forward to finding out myself. The great diaspora of, uh, of, 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 of MSR and DEC folk. Yeah. All right, cool. Thanks for your time, and uh, I'll stick around. So thanks. It's a lot of fun.